My name is Annie Sparks and I'm the program coordinator for Maryland Access Point of Queen Anne's County, which works within the Department of Community Services Area Agency on Aging. I also serve on the Suicide Prevention Committee, which works in partnership with Midshore Mental Health Systems to bring you these PSAs on suicide. Today we'll be, we will be talking about suicide in older adults, and we have two experts on hand, Kim Burton and Marge Mauclair, who will be talking about suicide in older adults. They will be sharing stories, statistics, and resources. We thank you for joining us, and now here is Kim and Marge. Hi, my name is Kim Burton. I work for the Mental Health Association of Maryland. I'm the director of older adult programs, and I'm here with my friend Marge Mulcair, who is formerly with the Mental Hygiene Administration, and now she's a great, fierce, devoted advocate for older adults. And we're going to talk about um, suicide today, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about what people should look for, what the risk factors are, and then what we can do as a community and as individuals to make sure that we are talking about this issue because this is a very important uh, issue. Older adults are highly stigmatized and suicide is highly stigmatized. We don't talk enough about it. Um, it's a difficult conversation for people to have, but it's really important because older adults are among the highest uh, rate of mm -hmm. suicide deaths of any population. As a matter of fact, older adults, older men over the age of 85 are four times more likely to die by suicide than any other population. It's more typical that older men die by suicide than older women. Um, they have very high rates of completion. Some of the reasons are that they use very lethal means Firearms are the most common, um, commonly used means for suicide in older adults. But it's also less likely that they will be saved, both because they're often alone, living alone and may not be found soon enough, or because their bodies are older and cannot recover from the insult of the um, suicide attempt. We see suicide as a preventable uh, death Suicide most often occurs because people have depression, and depression is a treatable disease. And what we find is that when people are treated for depression, they no longer have suicidal thoughts or their suicidal thoughts are greatly reduced. So if we can be talking about depression and learning about depression and detecting depression, we have a much better uh, chance of helping somebody, an older adult, who might be thinking about suicide. So Marge is here today to share a story of um, a friend that she has, and I think this will nicely illustrate what we're talking about. And um, so Marge, please go ahead. Thanks, Kim. Uh, one of the things I'd like to point out, which I know you're well aware of, is the fact that these high rates of suicide are among older adults. They're the least, the least and the last to be treated. Um, and you mentioned a lot of statistics. I'd like to take those statistics and bring it down to one person. This is a personal story about a friend of mine. I'd like to tell you about her. Um, I don't want her to be just another number, another statistic. I want you to see her the way I see her and the way I knew her. She was once a very vibrant, lively, active woman and she's not now. Sadly, because she thinks it's part of getting older, and why should she try any longer? She's in her 70s now, and like a lot of older people, she's facing chronic physical illnesses. That's causing depression in her. She's on a lot of medications, and she's not used to that. She's not used to knowing herself the way she now is. And so she's accepting that. She's not fighting it. She's not asking, is there another way for me to be? Is there anything left to me? And there is. Uh, some of the things I've noticed in her is she has ex um, experienced some loss. Uh, her husband died about a year ago. And her family moved away like families will. Uh, you know, uh, job promotions and better schools and whatever. She's finding herself without the roles that she once had in her various stages in life. And um, I'm noticing lots of changes in her and not reaching her. Um, she doesn't get around like she used to. 
she used to enjoy driving. She's had many accidents, mm -hmm. um, sometimes because she's drinking, sometimes because she's forgetting where she's going, and she won't drive now. And of course, I don't think they'd let her if she tried. Mm -hmm. um, she's um, perhaps risky uh, for herself and others. And so as a result, she's very isolated and she has stopped taking care of herself. She used to be more conscious of how she looked, getting her hair done, her nails done, mm -hmm. and uh, staying in fashion. Um, now, she says, what's the point? She has no place to go. She has no one to go with. She can't get herself there. She is not used to being dependent on other people. So she's, she's floundering, and I'm watching her decline and fail and become far more vulnerable than I've ever known her to be. And I know this is very upsetting to her. She doesn't go to the uh, community programs she used to go to. She stopped her memberships in various clubs and activities. And I tried to talk to her about all this. She doesn't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. She gets very angry, agitated, irritated. And she says to me, if you make me talk about this, you're going to make it happen. If I start thinking these thoughts that I know you're thinking about me, I might end up doing something to hurt myself. So why don't you just stop talking to me about this? So I don't know what to do. I feel like if she talked about it, it might help. But she's never been one to be very good at expressing her feelings or wanting to talk about her personal issues. Um, she was more, more fun, more lively, and she's not one that just dwell on these things. But I, I really worried about her. Um, she feels like me trying to make her talk is just making her life worse. And she pulls out her medications and she shows me that um, she's taken medicine for this and medicine for that, and they're all supposed to help her. And she did point out that they're not helping her, so she's now taking alcohol to add to that so she can get a certain level of comfort and get rid of some of this pain that she feels. She tells me that sometimes this pain is so bad she just wants it all to be over. She just wants it to end. And so um, the other thing I noticed is she stopped eating. There's no food in her refrigerator when you look. If I ask her for having lunch, she'd go out to lunch. She says, oh, I don't bother. I'm not hungry. I'm not hungry anymore. And I said, well, that must be making you feel pretty weak. And she said, well, I guess it is. She says, I'm sleeping more than I used to. Or sometimes I just can't sleep at all. And she said, so I just take another pill, another glass of wine, see if that helps me or so. So, um, I think I've done what I can, and I'm not sure what else I can do for her, Kim. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to reach her, and I'm afraid it's, if somebody doesn't try to help her, I'm afraid what's going to happen, and what, what, what do you think? I think that what you have just talked about probably brings up 20, maybe 30 different risk factors for this individual. So you know her to be a person who was very different yes. than who yes. she is now. And what we're always looking for in terms of a mental illness is, is the person different from how they used to be? She is. So that is a, a primary red flag, a first red flag. You mentioned health issues. Mm -hmm. You mentioned multiple changes in her life mm -hmm. that represent loss. Yeah. And yeah. change is stressful. Change is always stressful, whether it's for the good or for the bad. If a new baby was introduced into her family, yeah. that would be a stressful situation. Yeah. But when change is associated with loss, that's all the more difficult. And what we see with older adults, unfortunately, are compounding changes. So loss of a husband, loss of driving, mm -hmm. loss of community network. Yeah. She's no longer participating. She didn't renew memberships. Yeah. So these are red flags. Another big red flag that you talked about was taking medications, mm -hmm. pain, and on top of that, alcohol. And we see the use of alcohol rising among older adults, often to alleviate pain, 
but also to alleviate loneliness. That's what she said. So when we look at what are the red flags for individuals who might be at greater risk, what we look for is depression. Have they had a prior attempt? The other thing hmm. that we want to look for is whether or not they have a family member or a friend that ever attempted. Her mother. Mm -hmm. Her mother died of suicide. So that elevates her risk um, all the more, too. We're looking for illnesses that impede function. We are looking for illnesses, as I said, that may cause pain. Or any new diagnosis of an illness that makes a person concerned that it's going to impact their social life, their family life, or their life expectancy. Yeah, she thinks she's ugly now. Mm -hmm. And um, she doesn't want people to see her. She doesn't want anyone to look at her. Um, and she thinks she's fat. So those changes too, people f start to feel guilty. They start to feel bad about those pills. Yeah. They start to express shame. Yes. And they yes. pull away from other people. And even if family and friends are reaching out to them, they often say, um, I'm not feeling well. And unfortunately, when we hear an older adult say, I'm not feeling well, we just accept that. And we think that's a normal part of aging. Mm -hmm. Well. It's not. When somebody's not feeling well, if it was a younger person and they say that to you a couple of times, mm -hmm. you're going to ask them, have they talked to their doctor? And this is something that you as an individual mm -hmm. can do for your friend. I want to talk now, we just talked a little bit about risk factors. Sure. I want to talk about what can we do as a community oh, that would be helpful. and what we can do um, as individuals. As an individual, you, her friend, noticing the change, it is in really important that you have a conversation with her. And like I said in the beginning, these conversations can be very difficult to have and yeah. very uncomfortable, yeah. especially when somebody says, I don't want to talk about it. Yeah, she knows I'm a social worker and she thinks I'm just trying to be her therapist. I'm really just trying to be her friend. Mm -hmm. I think that it would be really important for you to tell her that. Okay. I'm not trying to be your social worker. I'm trying to be your friend. And what we want to do we want to ask, we want to listen, we want to provide comfort, and we also want to pass them on to the next person that can help them. It's very important that you know you're not her doctor, you're not her therapist. And so ultimately what we're trying to do is get that older individual mm -hmm. into the hands of a professional. Oftentimes they talk to their doctors first. Okay. So what you can say is, here are the changes I've noticed. And you're not going to say it judgmentally, mm -hmm. because if you do, you're going to break that relationship. Right. Likewise, if, you, if somebody says, as I kind of have heard, that she's making statements mm -hmm. that reflect that she doesn't want to be here anymore, yeah. sometimes our inclination is to say to somebody, you're not thinking about suicide, are you? And if we do that, did you see my face? Yes, That's a judgment. What I'm, the message I'm yeah. giving to you is that you wouldn't do that. And so it's natural for a lot of people to say you wouldn't do that or think of what you might be doing to your family. Um, this would be immoral. This would be against your religion. And when we say or make those statements, that can close the conversation. So we want to be very open and not judgmental and say, what I'm hearing you say is that you don't want to be here anymore. We're looking for an intent. So I would say, I hear you say you don't want to be here anymore. Have you thought about taking your own life? Now that may sound very dramatic to us, but for somebody who's thinking about dying every day, that's not a dramatic question. In fact, that's often a relief valve. They feel like they might be able to talk about it. Thank you. So I would also then say, if, if your friend says that she does think about it, the next thing you want to know is do they have a plan all right, we're looking for severity here. It's scary and sad enough mm -hmm. if somebody's feeling like they want to die. Then when they start to feel like they have a solution to this, mm -hmm. and their solution is death, because yeah. not being here, you think it might be better than the pain that you're in. That's so how bad depression is. So you're suggesting I might try to find a way to let her know I'm, I'm trying to comfort her and give her hope. Mm -hmm. Well, so the hope would then come in the, f the hope might come after you get information. So 
um, asking her if she has thought about taking her own life, if she thought about how she might do that. Mm -hmm. Because people make plans. And if you are non-judgmental and open mm -hmm. and listening and compassionate, she might say something like, well, I've thought about taking all of my pills at one time, or I've thought about combining my pills with mm -hmm. alcohol, which, by the way, she's already doing. Um, you said that she's not eating so much. Right. There's something called passive suicide that we really don't hear about. But passive suicide is very common among older adults. And that is um, death by means of not taking care of yourself. So if somebody stops yeah. eating, or they stop taking medications that are mm -hmm. vital to their yeah. life, yeah. or if they start doing things that are risky. And you're talking about her drinking like and driving. And her car accidents. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So those might be passive means to somebody achieving their own death. Another thing I want to let you know that's really important that people don't think about is that when people are feeling the despair of depression, mm -hmm. and then they have an idea of how they're going to end that depression, they might get a burst of energy. They might start to feel happy, not happy as in not depressed anymore, yeah. but happy as in I know how I'm going to be relieved. And what we see then is that people start to visit old friends almost as a goodbye. And they wrap up things that they need to do. They might check in with their banker. They might check in with whomever's in charge of their estate or their will. And oftentimes it's at the funeral when people come together that they realize, oh, they visited me, they visited me, they visited me. And the picture's put together then. This is why we as a community need to talk about it. This is why when we have a sense that a friend of ours might be in desperate need, or mm -hmm. maybe not even desperate need, even if they're mildly depressed, yeah. for an older adult, even a mild depression is something that can be very debilitating and deadly. Depression is deadly. Depression often leads to suicide. This is a preventable death. What can we as a community do to prevent this kind of thing happening? Well, education is primary. Mm -hmm. So talking about it. And many people don't want to talk about it, as your friend said, right. because they're afraid it's going to make things more depressing. Hope. You said that very important word. And hope is what we want to message. Depression is an illness we want to talk about because the hope for treatment is fantastic. Most people respond to treatment so they can turn their life around. People talk about their other illnesses, diabetes, cancer, lung disease, and they talk about the hope of treatment. Right. They talk about fighting exactly. the cancer or fighting that exactly. disease. But if we don't talk about depression or we mm -hmm. don't talk about anxiety or other mental illnesses, then we can't talk about the hope of treatment. That's so important. Now, when you're talking to your friend, you want to be careful not to talk them out of it or try to encourage them. So you wouldn't want to say something like, oh, but your life is so good and you've got so much to live for, because that's not how they're feeling. No, it's not how she feels. You want to talk to them at the level that they're feeling. So I would say mm -hmm. to my friend, I know that you feel horrible. I can hear the desperation in your voice. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that you don't want to be here. I, as your friend, feel really hopeful for you. I think that things could be different. And I want to be a part of that solution. So you might want to offer to accompany that person to see a doctor. So I might say to my friend, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a therapist. I'm just somebody who loves you and believes that you can feel better. And I'm also somebody who can help you take that next step. So that's when we want to be aware of the resources that are available so that we can take this person to that next step, that their depression can be treated, that they're no longer suicidal, and then we come to some problem solving because for older adults, we need to figure out if she can't drive anymore, yeah. what is the transportation? Yeah. So that's why we reach out to such agencies as the Area Agency on Aging, and we find out how can we rebuild or actually fill in those holes that have developed in her life mm -hmm. with meaningful enga engagement, reconnecting with the community, and finding a sense of purpose. This is great, Kim. These are wonderful suggestions. Thank you so much. Yeah, I hope that's helpful. It's very helpful. If you want to get more information about mental health problems mm -hmm. or what you can do if you're concerned about a friend, Maryland has a mental health and aging website. 
It's www.mdaging, stands for Maryland Aging, mdaging, Aging. Okay. mdaging org. And you can get more information, and there's also a phone number. If you don't really know how to have this conversation or you have more questions, mm -hmm. that number comes to me. We can talk more about it, um, and we're available to support and to help. There are other resources in the community that you're going to hear about in a few minutes. Great. Thank you, Kim. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Kim and Marge. Here are some additional resources that you can reach out to receive more information. Also, thank you to QAC-TV for putting out these public service announcements. Now is the time. <laughs>